in it, it, there was actually snow in some places. Moab, lovely. Yeah. All right, Ed, go ahead. Welcome to the Explorers Club Monday Night Lecture Series. My name is Ann Passer, and I am your chair of events at the club. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. And I just want to tell everybody, go and get a drink, because um, tonight's guest is someone I've been trying to bring to you for years, Nathan Mirvold. And I know you'll enjoy this evening's special presentation. But first, I'd like to introduce you to our host for the evening, Mark Brian Brown. If the name sounds familiar, it should. He's a member of the Explorers Club Board of Directors and the chair of the membership committee. For those of you who are new members, a letter from Mark is always welcome. Mark is also a freelance documentary photographer based in New York's Hudson Valley. Apropos to tonight's lecture, Mark lives on a working garlic farm where he specializes in garlic sourced from expeditions to the near and middle east. Please help me welcome Mark Brian Brown. Good evening. Am I there? Um, so Nathan Mirvold is the former CTO of Microsoft and the author of the six volume James Beard award winning modernist cookbook. Monist Cuisine Cookbook, excuse me, which is almost universally recognized as the reference term on the science of food preparation. He is also an award-winning photographer, a noted paleontologist, a disruptive astronomer, a nuclear scientist. The list goes on and on. It's often said that the early 18th century scientist and explorer, Alexander Humboldt, was the last person to know everything. Somehow, after all I've been reading about today, I think that Nathan is nipping at his heels. Tonight, we will discuss as much as we can of Nathan's work, uh, focusing in on his photography. Um, so please, oh, well, and uh, those of you watching, you know how to write in questions, uh, do it through the Facebook comments, and we will get to as many of those as we can. Uh, please welcome Nathan Mibbold. Well, thank you. Terrific. Well, thank you for coming. I uh, uh, hope you uh, are having a good time out there in, uh, in preparation for tomorrow's impending doom. Let's hope it all goes smoothly. Um, uh, so um, here it is. What, why don't we talk about, uh, talk about what, what this is and why you do it? And, uh, and okay, well, uh, you know, I, I do a set of things that might not make sense only to me, <laughs> but I, I'm more than happy to share about them. Um, uh, uh, photography has been something that I've done since I was very young, six years old, something like that. Uh, when I was in high school, I got a view camera and uh, actually went to go see Ansel Adams. <laughs> uh, and uh, these days I do a kind of photography that uh, doesn't take no for an answer if the equipment isn't up to it. We make our own cameras and optical systems and other things, uh, or we make robots to help uh, tell, take a picture and tell a story. Great. Um, is is intertwined up? Oh, there it is. So there you are. So so tell us tell us a little. Yeah, they, the the previous shot showed the uh, this uh, wine. <clears throat> wonderfully, there you go. <clears throat> Two glasses with wine wonderfully intertwined around each other. So I wanted to show some great pictures of wine. Well, how do you do that? Well, splashing it certainly helps. Lots of people do, do that. Uh, in order to make the uh, shot controllable, what we always try to do is make it repeatable first. If it's repeatable, then you can control it. And so we built a uh, robot that throws wine glasses. And you can see in the, the foreground here, there's a, a big piece of aluminum. Uh, that is uh, the sled that holds the wine uh, uh, glass and it shoots along. And then you can also see there's a, a, uh, a little curb here that's called the toe kick. And if you put that in place, then it tips the, uh, uh, the glass over. And here we can see one of the shots. So 
if it wasn't for the uh, ubiquitous uh, digital technology and robotics and so forth, it'd be a very difficult shot to take. Um, with it, it is still a difficult shot to take, but uh, at least you've got a, sh a chance. Excellent. Let's uh, let's move. Can we move on to the sure. to the next one? Oh, wow! I didn't know this one was next. Um, okay. Uh, well, I think most of us would know what this is, um, but why don't you why don't you tell us? <laughs> this is ice, um, and this is a piece of a glacier. But it's a piece of a glacier that has a uh, an interesting story behind it. Of course, glaciers uh, are formed when snow compact and compacted snow is white. Well, as uh, the snow gets compacted more and more, uh, it gets bluer and bluer. And if you look at the face of a big glacier, you often see up at the top, it's pure white. And as you come down the sides, it gets more of this blue thing. Well, if it's all the way at the very bottom, friction and pressure from this mountain of ice on top of it can cause the uh, water to melt and then refreeze. And when that happens, it's dead clear. Now that particular piece was floating in a bay in a place called Narsok in Greenland. And there is almost all of the town of Narsok. Um, which is a fabulous place to visit. Um, I was shocked when I was walking on the street that the main square is named for um, Nels Bohr. And it turned out that the Bohr uh, before the Second World War had a uranium mine in Narsok. And that's where he hoped to get uranium for understanding fission. Um, now, as it happens, he got sneaked out of Europe by uh, the US military, they took him to New Mexico and he was part of the Manhattan Project. So, um, so when, what time, so you went there and you, you sourced this piece of ice, you like sort of wandered around and- No, I was being shown around by a guy who uh, had an, I mean, interesting idea. He wanted to make a ancient water uh, beer. So <laughs> his solution was to motor around the bay and net icebergs. And particularly he liked the super clear ones. Then you take it back and we hauled one back to his place where he would then melt it and make a uh, beer out of it. How's the, taste, out. how's the taste of the water? Of well, the melted, <laughs> melted glacier? It turns out it's, so this particular stuff was so pure and it had so few minerals in it that the yeast wouldn't grow. <laughs> so he had to actually add um, some minerals and some vitamins because just the, the yeast was lacking a couple of uh, key things that are typically in uh, water. Uh, you, how old do you estimate that chunk of ice would be? <clears throat> um, at least 10,000 years, but it's probably more like 25, 30. Wow. And uh, when, did you, when did you go? When was that? Oh, that was, I don't know, 15 years ago, something like that. Right. right. I, I love traveling and uh, I was in Iceland and I thought, well, why don't I try to go to Greenland too? Wow. What's up next? So, um, <clears throat> this is uh, the Badlands. And this is a particular set of Badlands in Montana, um, which uh, over the course of the last 20 years has been one of the most productive sites for paleontology, uh, both for dinosaurs and for early mammals. Um, but the farmer who owned it unfortunately needed to sell. Um, so now it is my piece of Badland. Um, and uh, you always find dinosaurs in places like this where, first of all, you need geology to have brought rocks up to the surface. The rocks have to be the right age, but then you also need terrible weather. 
And you need terrible weather because otherwise uh, plants will form and there'll be grasses and trees and it stabilizes everything. Instead, what you need to find dinosaurs is flash floods and lots of erosion. Because then when you walk through this badland area, and you have to keep you know, doing it every year, of course, you see bones on the surface and that's how dinosaurs are found. And uh, this is in is that fact, FEMA? Is that a uh, me at a dig, this is a piece of a Tyrannosaurus rex that I found. Uh, not on that property, on a different uh, site. And here you can see there's a bone uh, that is uh, sticking out. And in archaeology, people will sometimes like go to a cave and excavate it, or they'll go to where a city might have been and excavate it. Dig, dig at random. Uh, you never do that with paleontology because there's not quite enough fossils. You wait until you see a piece of dinosaur sticking out of the ground, and then you start digging it, usually with brushes and uh, uh, a screwdriver there or whatever, but sometimes uh, heavy equipment. So do you, do you, um, so you do an annual trip to your, to your land and take a look or? <clears throat> um, well, I've just, uh, I, that's a fairly recent picture. I only recently bought it. Um, but I, I go or, and, or I also sponsor other people going uh, to digs and I have every year for 20, 25 years. Wow. It's, uh, it, dinosaur digging is sort of hiking with a purpose. And I, f photography I love because it makes you look at everything more precisely and carefully than if you're just wandering by. Well, dinosaur digging is similar, except in this case, you're looking down, looking for a piece of bone and just hopeful at every point, it'll be something cool. When did you, when did you first, uh, when did that, when did you first get the bug? Well, I, all people interested in dinosaur paleontology were, as, uh, were interested in dinosaurs as kids, 100% of us. It's just, uh, some of us outgrew it. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> I guess in the 90s, I, uh, I met Jack Horner on the set of Jurassic Park, believe it or not. And uh, Jack said, why don't you come on out and get involved and really do some research? And so I did, and he and I have partnered as well as uh, I work with Paul Serino and Phil Curry and a variety of other uh, uh, paleontologists. Amazing. Okay, I work today on a paper on Spinosaurus. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. <clears throat> so, um, these are the happiest cows in the world if you go by um, uh, either the marketing slogans or by how the cows uh, react to the environment. Uh, this is in uh, the Savoy region in France. And it's part of a series of pictures to try to capture some idea of how place affects food. So here you have these fantastically beautiful cows with big handmade bells. Um, and they're eating the grass in this high alpine meadow. Why? So we can have Comte and Gruyere cheese. And, and Reblochon too, right? Reblochon, well, there's, it's actually a little bit lower that you get the Reblochon, a little uh, lower altitude. I but it's, it's another wonderful cheese. Now, unfortunately, they're friendly. <laughs> they're real friendly. And uh, you, I wanted to take pictures of them mostly like, um, like the picture you just saw. But after screwing up their cow courage a little bit, they all decided it would be really cool to come over and lick me and my camera and equipment. <laughs> and that made for a little bit of a, uh, it <clears throat> harder to get as classy a shot. Do, do you think it would be possible to uh, to so what what makes the grass <laughs> so special? Why, why would this be possible to replicate, or is it? It's I mean, you know, it's a really good question, and it's uh, it's a hard question to answer because, of course, 
uh, there's a lot of tradition involved and people hate going against tradition. Um, and there's a lot of self-interest involved where various parts of the world will say, well, I'm the only place that can make you know, this wine that tastes this way or this cheese that tastes this way. Um, with cheese, it's pretty well established that you can make an excellent Camembert, for example, or Brie in the United States. Getting the milk to be exactly the same is more difficult because that milk or that the, the milk comes from the grass. The grass has got quite a few um, different uh, compounds, particularly uh, carotenoids. So that's the uh, like carrot, um, carotene is a good example in carrots. And it turns out in cows, cows don't digest carotene. So any carotene that's in their feed is a fat soluble substance that is in them and it winds up in the milk. And that's why butter is yellow. Meanwhile, goats actually digest carotene. That's why goat milk and goat cheese are dead white. Excellent, excellent. So do you think that, um... Do you, I mean, you, you, you have all this science that you understand about the food. Are you, do you hope to inform those who work in food so that they can try to improve the food around them? Or is it more just the journey to you is everything? I mean, the reason I take the trouble of writing big books is to communicate knowledge and to try to improve cooking. So, you know, to pick an example of a modern architect, Frank Geary uh, really came into his own when CAD programs and modern construction could allow these wild curvy buildings that he makes. Um, telling him he had to use bricks from Home Depot, you wouldn't get the same result. And Frank couldn't build those wonderful curvy buildings if he didn't understand what makes a building stand up. Now, in the same way, I think that understanding how food actually works, how the physics of heat moving through food, how the chemistry of different things in food interacting, I think understanding that is both cool and interesting, and I like it, and I, other people seem to. But if you're a chef, it's really essential if you're going to create. You know, the, the model for most uh, uh, chefs or for most cooking instruction has been the recipe. Do this, do this, do this, do this, and you get a result. And if all you ever wanna do is continue to make that one thing, it's great. But if you wanna make a new thing, that's where it really helps to understand how things work. Excellent. <laughs> okay, so here is, um, uh, Italy in a sea of red wine. So <laughs> there, there's, there's two different aspects of this. The first is, I mentioned I'm writing a book on pizza. Well, you write a book on pizza, I want to do something that showed that pizza was sort of iconically Italian. And that's actually a little bit of a lie because when it comes to food, there's no place called Italy really. It's all different regions, but, but fine. So that was one part of it. Now, the other part of it is comes from the Odyssey. And in the Odyssey, there's a stock phrase that Homer uses, or you know, whomever Homer was, that uh, they're always sailing across the broad back of the wine dark sea. Hmm. So Okay, well, let's make a pizza in the shape of Italy, but then you have to have an ocean. Well, what are you going to do? Well, that's where Odysseus came in, and that's uh, 40 gallons of red wine uh, that is in a precarious uh, state. <clears throat> and then what you see me doing there is we didn't want to just sit there. We wanted to have waves. Well, to get the waves, you both have to light it the right way. But then I've got a compressed air hose 
And I am playing, I guess if we stick with Odyssey, I'm playing Poseidon, who's stirring up the waves by squirting air at various parts of the thing and uh, taking a picture. So, so this could have been, you could have done this as a composite. Yeah, but where's the fun in that? Well, I mean, yeah, that's where I'm going. But that, obviously that's, yeah. <laughs> it, you know, the, there are there are times and places where you cannot possibly do something uh, without some amount of improvisation or people could also call it cheating. And I don't view it as cheating. I don't think people who, who take, ultimately it's photography is about the end work it's not about the um, uh, all of how you get there, but as much as possible, we try to make the stuff real. And I think it, even if it doesn't matter to the end viewer, it matters to me. And uh, I'm, I'm not even going to ask what the wine was. <laughs> it turns out, even if it comes in a box, you can have a very good color. <laughs> <coughs> so um, when I was a kid, uh, I, I did many things. But one of the things I did was take my mother's car apart and put it back together. And... Uh, there was a repair manual called Chilter Chilton's Manual for, you know, XX car. And it was full of what they called exploded diagrams. So you'd see a piece of the car, like a carburetor. Um, most people these days don't even know what a carburetor is, by the way. Um, and it would be exploded out in space to show you all of how it came together. Well, when it, in modernist cuisine, it came to a point where we were, we had a section on, um, actually, about our cuisine at home, we had a section on sandwiches. Well, how do you show how a sandwich comes together? So I thought, oh, let's do an exploded diagram, like the children's repair manual for cars. And that's where that came from. Yeah, the, 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 wow. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so there's several ways that we <clears throat> have come up with doing this. Um, obviously, levitation is is a trick, right? It, you, you can't actually make it float. Although one of my people suggested very strongly that we go to the vomit comet uh, plane that has weightlessness to try to do one of these shoots. Um, so if you measure out what the right angles are, you can then shoot each uh, piece individually and composite them. So this is a case where this particular shot we did use this way, which you could call cheating. Well, I, 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 we I, later I, made cheating. we later made a way to do it without cheating, and I also have shot that. Then um, the camera beside me may look like it's a conventional camera, um, a conventional view camera, but it isn't. Um, I made that thing. And the it's, lens board is the only conventional thing about it as far as I can see. Yes, exactly. It's, yeah. We were going to go and make our own lens boards, but you can get them for about $5 each on eBay. So like, wow, well, what the hell? Yeah. <laughs> um, but the, uh, I mean, it, it's it's one thing. So to have you, feel, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, just a wonderful graphic. Do you feel it has, um, do you, you do, do you have other applications for for the sort of exploding photography? Uh, well, I, I've got a pizza book that I've mentioned a couple of times now. Right. And, right. So that was one of our big questions. Could we show the assembly instructions for a pizza? Right, you've got dough and then a layer of sauce and cheese and maybe sausage or peppers or something. Could we do that effectively this way? And by God, we did. <laughs> now, I, I can't tell you, you know, saying, oh, well, I can do sandwiches and pizza. It's not like, whoa, this is going to revolutionize photography. Well, you know, the, the cheese actually, to me, looked like the easiest, one of the easier parts of that. I mean, the, the sources, I just can't imagine. Really amazing. Well, it, it turns out if you take a big piece of saran wrap, 
and you squirt the sauce on it and you drop it, it'll kind of float for a bit. <laughs> and now it, we also have a rule, um, which it totally goes with this uh, picture too, which is it only needs to look good for a thousandth of a second. After that, it can all go to hell and we make a big mess. Um, <clears throat> so I've always wondered what, how things work and how they look inside. And uh, in Modernist Cuisine, we started by taking pictures uh, of uh, pots and pans with food in them to show you what happened in the pots and pans while you're cooking. Uh, we still do that, but we also sometimes will cut the whole machine apart so you can see all the cool little parts. And uh, that's what this is. Damien, Damien Hurst on a household. Oh my gosh, look at that. Now, this is why we're able to do that. So <clears throat> this is my machine shop. Um, my company invents new things and turns out if you invent a brand new thing, there's no one there to build it except you. Uh, so we made this machine shop and each of these machines in here is able to cut, shape, mold, do something to glass, plastic, metal, wood, pretty much anything. Um, and so that's where we go to cut stuff in half. How do you feel about printing food? Well, <coughs> the... The thing, oh yeah, here, here's, here's an oh, example. There we go, the cutaway, yeah. Um, go ahead. So a, a lot of people think we composite the, the pictures and it frankly would be easier to. Um, in that case, uh, it's uh, a blender with tomatoes in it being turned into tomato sauce. And I stacked all of those tomatoes in there by hand with little needles stuck into them so they'd stick to each each other a little bit. And it was just enough that we're able to um, take the picture. Now, twice they all fell out and I had to start over again. But again, it doesn't have to look good for long. And I'm sorry, you'd asked a question before. Yeah, well, I was just I'm looking at your machine shop, which is fairly extensive. I, I you know, I'm, I'm thinking about how people are printing prosthetic limbs and printing yeah. I'm wondering, <laughs> the concept of printing food. Um, so we have, I don't know, edible seven or so probably 3D printers of different types. And it's a wonderful technology for doing some things. Um, the direct printing of food is, uh, is, is not quite there yet. Um, there's a cool thing you can buy on Amazon called Pancake Bot, which will let you make a pancake like in the shape of the Eiffel Tower or all kinds of other stuff. That's about as far as it goes. Now, there's people who want to make multi-flavored, and we've played around with this, where you have uh, a set of different inks, if you will, but they're flavors. Um, and at the moment, I don't think there's anything you can do with that that is remarkably compelling in how it tastes. I mean, it tastes okay, and it might have a really cool shape, and that's worth something. But at the moment, it's not something that says, oh, wow, this is, uh, this is fantastic. Instead, what I use is I use it to make dishes. I mean, literally the dishes. I've got a, we've made a whole set of, uh, uh, table furnishings for some of our special dinners. And uh, the best way to do that, we found, is to, uh, I, I've written my own software to make the shapes, then I 3D print it, then we use that to make a mold out of plaster of Paris called a hump mold, believe it or not, that's the ceramicist's term, and then we make the uh, stuff out of porcelain. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, the the molecular food sort of uh, craze, I mean, is craze the right word? You know, sort of the Wally Dufresne, the WD-40, yeah. El Bulli. For some reason, Catalonia, Spain seems to be full of it. Um, 
but it doesn't seem to have really caught on where people sort of create fake food, things that don't look like what well, they are. Is it sort of magician? I, you know, do you, how do you feel? Yeah, about and I, I suspect with uh, deep uh, apologies to the poet laureate, you could look at the sales of the current or the last 10 US poet laureates and you could say, oh, you know, their stuff didn't catch on. It, it didn't outsell, um, you know, Harry Potter or it didn't outsell uh, some uh, beach thriller. And that's true. But the, the role that Ferran and others had was a really, very, in, in my view, a very intellectual, very artistic, very creative uh, element. Um, and I think it's true that both because of the things that Ferran and Heston Blumenthal and Wiley Dufresne and others did, not only do you see that out there, it's almost ubiquitous if you know where to look. Now, and some of that has to do with me because my cookbook told people how to use it. But that how to use it doesn't mean that they're all going to go do abstract blank verse. They're going to go and use, use it for whatever purpose, uh, culinary purpose they have, which, in most restaurants, isn't that? Well, yeah, it, they're enormous fun, that's for sure. <clears throat> you, you know, it's, I, I like to compare food to architecture. Um, most food is about sustenance, it's about fuel. And most buildings are about keeping the weather out. They're not great works of art. But an architect who is very creative can make a building or a built environment that grabs you emotionally, that is as much art as anything else. And I think that is true of the very greatest uh, shafts as well. What's that? How are we doing, Caitlin? Thank you. Okay, so uh, here is a um, champagne uh, uh, cork that has been sabered. Uh, I went to chef school in France many years ago and I learned how to saber champagne. Well, in order to do it repeatedly so we could get a good shot, of course, we made a robot. So here is a saber bot in very slow motion. This is our, our slow motion camera. <laughs> <clears throat> so that allowed us to um, saber on command. Now, a problem when you do a shoot like this or that wine shoot is by the end of the day, your clothes are absolutely soaked. And so everybody in, that's there at the shoot, I have to make everybody promise they're not going to speed on the way home <laughs> because <laughs> they would surely be taken in as drunk. <laughs> Caitlin, can you show us the still of that again? of the of the the saber champagne shot um so how uh what what sort of is is this done through a shutter or through the flash duration is it like <laughs> flash more? duration well it's it's a little complicated you kind of have to do both but primarily what is stopping the motion here is uh ultra high speed flash and and what sort of speed are we talking about here for this? Um, that part. one was probably about one sixty-two thousandth of a second. And, and the wine glasses that we saw at the beginning, what would that be? Same sort of thing? Yeah. And, and what's the capability? Like how, how fast, uh, how, how, how quick? Well, that's how fast can... my strobes can go. <laughs> that's, that's max. There's no point in holding back. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And at that speed, they're not very bright. Sure. So you need to have four of them and you need to cluster them around. And uh, it's super important how you do the triggering because normal photographic um, things called slaves or transmitters that will help sync flash uh, aren't fast enough. They, they think too much, <laughs> basically. So you, you hardwire them or? Hardwire. Right, 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 right. 
technically at? So this picture is um, an example of a kind of pic shot I like to do, which is showing people a view of food they've never seen before. And I think it's fair to say almost anyone looking at this would say, they, A, they don't recognize it as food and they've never seen it before, but this is vitamin C. And uh, to get this, you take your vitamin C pill and you crush a little bit of it, mix it with water, put it on a microscope slide, and then you let it dry. And if you click here, here's a whole pile. We went through the kitchen. There's vitamins, there's red wine, there's <coughs> the morning's latte down there at the bottom. Um, <coughs> and many, but not all of these things will make very interesting crystals. And the most interesting are crystals that are called birefringent. So if we go back to the um, picture. A birefringent um, crystal transmits colors differently depending on whether the light that's hitting is polarized. Now, you've probably seen this if you put on polarized sunglasses and look at a car windshield. And in the car windshield, you can see some little colors. And that comes from the fact that the uh, binder that's in the center of safety glass for a windshield is slightly birefringent. Now it turns out vitamin C is really birefringent, so you get these really cool pictures. And and did did, did you you just tried all kinds of different products until you hit upon yes. vitamin C? And, and aspirin, is, aspirin is awesome. point, point source from a couple of directions or Wonder um, well, so for thi this is a special, uh, to take the pictures that I want to take with a microscope, I've had to build my own microscopes. Um, it turns out commercial microscopes make a series of trade-offs that are okay or have been historically viewed as being okay, but they don't let you take really large, high-resolution pictures. So I've made a custom microscope uh, which lets me take use a hundred megapixel back, um, a phase one back, and so I can make pictures like that that are remarkably more uh, better color depth and better resolution than anything you can do normally. And so that's my own crazy thing with its own illumination system and so forth. Right. And, well, beautiful, beautiful. So uh, <clears throat> these are blueberries. Um, it, it's surprising how many people will see this uh, on a wall really big and they won't know what they are because when you have a sense of scale out of it, you don't realize that that's what blueberries look like. And uh, this was a picture that I wanted to take for quite a while uh, until I finally built a camera to do it. Um, and I think that's next. Um, so this camera was made to take that picture. And of course, I'm happy to reuse it for other pictures, but uh, <coughs> it has a very exotic lens that is made by an industrial subsidiary of Nikon. And it's made for doing quality control on plasma TV screens, if you can believe it. Um, and it's got a very funny uh, little feature. Most lenses have an optimum place that the designer made all of the lens aberrations go away. For most pictures, that's at long distances, most, can most lenses. For a macro lens, that's at a short distance. Well, this lens is one of only about four in the world that has a gear that lets you null out the aberrations um. at any distance. And so we have uh, that is computer controlled and the focus is computer controlled. And that lets me take a picture like that. Now, that picture is probably 5,000 to 7,000 frames of phase one. 
So it's an enormous amount of data. Um, people have, will ask me, well, I, I could take a picture of, uh, you know, something like the blueberries in my iPhone. And the answer is yes, you could, but I found a way to do it that takes as many bits as half a million iPhone pictures. So, so how large could that image be blown up where it would be visually uh, so high, de high HD, should we say? I mean, I, you know. Really part. big. I have 30 like, like side of a building. Oh, yeah. 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 And in fact, the part I really love about the uh, pictures like that, including that one, is as you get it bigger and bigger and bigger, eventually you see the individual cells in the plant. You know, uh, it, could we go back to the picture for a moment, Caitlin? Um, when we were looking at it, uh, she was saying that, that she was saying you could see the yeast. Yes. Uh, so this dusty, the the sort of dusty covering uh, that is on um, blueberries, also on grapes and other things, are uh, natural yeasts, and they have. They're clinging on there, waiting for the day that they can get the juice inside. And so yeast is, the, that's always what's making that. Um, it, and it, it, if you handle them too much, of course, it comes off. Um, so that's one of the problems. Uh, it turns out when you audition for this kind of picture, you got to audition a lot of blueberries because <laughs> some of them, will have, you know, a fingerprint in the middle of it or something so else. Tweezers and such to, to... Oh, yeah. That sort of thing. Wow. Um, and why did you... And blueberries, I guess, because of this amazing sort of dusky... I mean, you could have used... Yeah. Blueberries I, and I do have pictures of other things. Yeah. Just, this course. happens to be blueberries. But yeah, but it's... It, yeah, it is... it is the, Yeah, there is something enchanting about them, for sure. I mean, just amazing. Wow. <clears throat> so this was another sort of an odyssey. Uh, of course, this is a snowflake. And uh, most of the water that we drink most of the year falls as snow. Okay, in anywhere in the, the United States, or most places in the United States, it's snow in the mountains that holds water that doesn't melt until the summer. And so you have some that comes as rain, but most of it is snow. So snow is super important. And I set out to take, a, I wanted to take really cool pictures of snow uh, and snowflakes like this. Now it turns out that's really hard. And there's only a few people crazy enough to try to take snowflake pictures in the world. Um, the first guy was a guy in the late 19th century named Snowflake Bentley. <laughs> um, uh, then there was a professor at Caltech. He was the um, chairman of the physics department at Caltech, Ken Liebrecht. And I met him many years ago. And I got really intrigued and said, you know, someday I'm going to go build a microscope like his. But then, of course, I got carried away. And I finally made my microscope, which I think is next. So <clears throat> this is a pretty exotic microscope. Um, the first thing is you can't bring the snowflake inside. Um, you have to take your microscope outside. So this whole thing has to work and function way below zero. Um, uh, the frame uh, is all made of carbon fiber. Uh, and that's because carbon fiber doesn't distort uh, when uh, it gets cold. Well, then there's a phase one back again. There's a super complicated lighting system. There is a is cold it, state. Is it flash or is it, I mean, the heat from any kind of light is an issue, yes? It is, but... <laughs> um, <laughs> it turns out there's a company in Japan that makes uh, LED lights that you can uh, flash super fast. 
And I say super fast. This is way faster than my strobes for the other uh, uh, thing. So this is one two hundred thousandth of a second. And <clears throat> I got them to sell me some. And of course, normally they use it for very exotic industrial things. And they said, well, what are you using it for? And I said, I want to take pictures <laughs> of snowflakes. Um, but uh, apparently they have enough of a sense of humor. They either thought I was kidding or, <laughs> or whatever. So that's part of it. Um, it. It turns out that if you put your snowflake onto a glass slide, there's a real danger the glass slide will be too warm because you handled it. And it's also, it turns out, it's hard to get glass cold. Um, so you want something that is clear, but uh, has a much higher thermal conductivity. So in fact, I use sapphire slides. And then we built a special cooling stage so that we can chill the sapphire right down to as, as close as we want to what the ambient temperature is. Now then, after all this, you have to go to a place where it's really cold uh, because you don't get really nice snowflakes if it's just like freezing out. Um, you need to have it be at least uh, five degrees below zero Fahrenheit and it works pretty well down to 15 below. Where, where do you like to go? Well, there's three places I like to go. Fairbanks, uh, a, a place called Yellowknife. Yeah, of course. Uh, in Canada. <laughs> and another place called Timmins, Timmins, Ontario. And uh, they are really, really, really cold. <laughs> um, and reliably so. And I have also found hotels that have a, uh, a porch or a uh, balcony so I can go out there and take the pictures. And uh, wow. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, amazing, amazing. Um, are we, is that the deck? Are we, are we at the end of the deck? Is there another one, Caitlin, or are we good to go here? Uh, I think we're all done. Excellent. Well, um, that was that was just astounding. I mean, um, and uh, thank you, thank you so so much. Um, we do have a few questions. I'm going to jump in with a quick one, which is um, no, actually, I'm going to go to the go to the deck here uh, from David Isserman. Um, I have a question. What is the one thing that you want to photograph that you have not been able to photograph yet? Is that something? <clears throat> well, I've spent the last couple months uh, trying to make a ultra high resolution gigapixel photograph of the Milky Way. And it keeps moving. Yeah. Well, it's Earth that keeps moving, but yes, it's, I've noticed. Well, they bet, and, yeah. And then the damn light, the sun comes up, and there's all these, these issues. And you need more uh, cameras, Nathan. Oh, I've got a bunch more for this <laughs> purpose. Um, and I've written a whole bunch of my own software. Uh, and we've taken uh, the other thing is Seattle is just not a great place to see uh, the stars. Mostly in Seattle, we see the underside of a rain cloud. So I've done uh, several uh, long trips to uh, Moab, <laughs> Utah, or to um, a place in Arizona that's out in the desert. Uh, and I've taken 160,000 frames on these last uh, uh, few trips. But we have, we're still now figuring out how to assemble this huge mosaic into a picture. So you gigapan, I mean, you, 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 you have to write your own software once you get this big. Is oh, that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, it's for, for, for lots of reasons. Uh, partially, we, could, we use lots of commercial software or astronomer's software. 
but there's aspects of the project that just you think, oh, surely there's a way to do that. Yes, but nobody cares except me, apparently. And and so, it, would this be something where you would? It, it's just something where you can just go deeper and deeper into it, or yes. with it, it's that's the idea. It's like you can look at it and then just go deeper and deeper. Yeah, oh. there's two ways to view this. One is, do you say you're going to view it interactively by zooming in, um, a little bit like zooming in on the um, blueberries until you see the individual cells. <clears throat> um, there's uh, the, it, but a different way is to say I'll make a big physical one and there's something pretty wonderful about the physicality Definitely. and then people if you see a giant picture they're used to the notion that as you walk up to it it the illusion breaks at some point you start seeing pixels or but the dreaded viewing distance not on these I love it um, and maybe this is a good moment. Um, I understand you've been doing quite a bit of work with meteors. Uh, yes, meteors and uh, asteroids. Right. <clears throat> yeah, so, um, you know, I, I used to be a physicist. I got a degree in physics at Princeton. Um, I was a postdoc with Stephen Hawking. Oh, that was yeah. my next question, but uh, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. Uh, and so I've always been interested in it, but because I was interested in dinosaurs, uh, we're all aware of like I, when I was at Princeton as a graduate student in physics, I went to the first lecture given on the theory that a, the dinosaurs were killed by an asteroid impact. And so immediately afterwards, I went up to uh, the Alvarez's who were the, the two uh, people who did this, I said, it's going to happen again. And they said, oh, yeah, sure. So that's been another little hobby of mine is to do research on asteroids and uh, try to figure out uh, how big they are, because that makes a great deal of difference for uh, if they hit Earth, how bad it would be. Wow. Um Okay, from Clifford Ross, what is the size of, I, I think just what's the size of the blueberry file? <laughs> um, <coughs> it's, the final file isn't all that big. It's, um, you know, 10 gig, probably. No, no, it's more than that. More than that. Um, it's, about 70, that one's about 70, no, again, I have to think of the pieces. It's, that's about a billion pixels. And a so, wow. yeah, we have, um, uh, each pixel is, you know, takes, we, we do everything in 32 bit per component. So that's, um, you know, quite a few bits. That's a lot of bits. Um, wow. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, why not grow your own snowflake? <laughs> so, <clears throat> so Ken Liebrich, this professor at, um, uh, at Caltech, besides uh, being the world's expert in snowflake photography, and he has advised me on many aspects of, of the design. He also built a machine to grow his own snowflakes. And he keeps telling me how to do the same thing, how to build my own. But I, I want to go out in the wild and catch a few more before I, uh, I do that. Um, uh, here's, a, here's a good one. Um, have you wanted to cook and examine food in space? Um, zero G kitchen. <laughs> do you have any thoughts on that? Is that... Yeah. Uh, well, well, would that make something possible that we have never even contemplated? Uh, well, the, there's, there's possibly, but it's hard to put your finger on what that would be. Um, it, there's, uh, there's a bunch of problems with cooking in, in space. Uh, and that's because convection doesn't work. You know, in... Uh, our stoves uh, at uh, at home, 
we have the fire and we have a pot that we put above the fire or the heating element. Well, if you had an electric element, the heat would go across, but hot air doesn't rise because there's no gravity. And so there are things that would seem very straightforward to do in cooking in space that don't work because you get balls of superheated air that will float around and then like bump into you or something else and burn you. And it's, it's quite a strange environment to cook. Uh, my, my great friend, Charles Simone, who's been to space twice, uh, has assured me it's not a place you go for the food. Yeah, you don't go for the food. That's what I... I it, it's all about the view. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, he's saying, uh, ask if he is involved in building a nuclear reactor, a salt reactor or... Yeah, I am. <laughs> so uh, my go company, uh, Intellectual Ventures, tries to... Uh, invent new technology. Now, it, as I think everybody knows, we're in a uh, crisis because of climate change. And we devoted quite a bit of invention and inventive activity towards how, to, how could we help with climate change? And one set of those ideas are kind of lunatic fringe or sounds like it, like we came up with a way to stop hurricanes which sounds crazy, but actually kind of pencils out. Um, but at the more mundane, uh, we invented a new type of nuclear power reactor. Uh, it created a company called Terra Power. Um, my uh, great friend and uh, collaborator, Bill Gates, is the chairman of Terra Power. And uh, Terra Power has invented actually several types of nuclear reactors trying to look at the problem of what, how could we fix nuclear to make it a means to decarbonize our economy? Now, of course, you could also say, well, why don't you work on renewables? And we've done some of that work too, but at the moment, the problem is so important. I think it behooves us to run down as many parallel paths as we can. Amazing. Um, so somebody here who wants to know why there's no cheese and tomato uh, in Salento and the heel of Italy on the pizza. <laughs> well, uh, you know, it, it, it's a it's a good example of the hyper locality of Italian cuisine. Ah, there you go. <laughs> um, it, it's. It, it, and the, the idea of, quote, Italian food is not a concept that really exists very well in Italy. Tuscany has Tuscan food. And Umbria has Umbrian food. Uh, so in uh, Naples, pizza is really originally a Naples thing. It was an urban food. Um, not even a, it's not a countryside food. It was a, the urban poor of Naples that invented pizza. Well, if you go uh, a little bit down the coast to uh, Cilento, they make a very different uh, pizza-like thing, which uh, you could call it a version of pizza. And they're kind of okay with that now, but really it's their unique thing. and. Uh, all across Italy, you'll find other kinds of flatbreads that have other kinds of toppings. Which, um, which, which part of Italy has the pineapple? <laughs> 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 well, um, so one of the things, if you're an American writing a book about pizza and you're traveling around Italy, you get lots of abuse from Italians who say, you ignorant Americans, how could you possibly put pineapple on pizza? But uh, just this last year, uh, Franco Pepe, who is uh, one of the greatest pizzolos in Italy, um, won a uh, year before last best pizzolo in the world and according to several different lists. Um, Franco has apparently come up with a pineapple pizza that he assures me is good. 
<laughs> I have not had it yet. Um, it's, you know, it's possible. I, I will say that the so-called Hawaiian pizza was invented in Toronto, so far as we can tell. <laughs> so it was a Canadian interpretation of what uh, warm Hawaii would be like. Um, uh, that's great. Um, uh, are, have any um, of the tools or technologies that you've used in your photography uh, been have have they found use in other industries? Do you feel you know? Well. It's digital imaging at some level is used on all kinds of industries. Uh, most people who, uh, who are out to take a picture, take a picture of the conventional camera. And there's a lot of reason to do that. Building your own camera is hard and frustrating and you can't take it back to the maker and be mad at them. Um, but at the same time, people are using digital imaging in all kinds of ways. So here's an example. Uh, I work with uh, paleontologists who try to uh, develop growth curves uh, for dinosaurs. Now, it turns out you can do that because if you saw the bones of the dinosaurs uh, in half, particularly a big leg bone is great. <clears throat> they have rings very much like a tree has rings. And those rings are places where the growth was interrupted during a year. Um, well, it turns out to make this work, what you do is you slice this dinosaur bone, then you have to photograph it many times, then you stitch all of those images together to make one giant resolution thing. So it's paleontology using panorama stitching, which is a, an algorithm from um, landscape photography, but it works great. Um, yeah. th that lens that I had, the magic lens from Japan, was made so that you could make sure you didn't have a bad pixel in your uh, flat screen TV. But hey, as an aside effect, it works really well at taking these other pictures. So there's a lot of ways these things are used. Um, a lot of the stuff, though, that I do is too hard for many other people to do it, I think. Well, certainly too, very involved. I mean, it, it, just amazing. Um, all right. Well, this has been absolutely amazing. We have one last question here, which um, uh, one of the audience members would like to advise on uh, a wine that would reduce stress that they could drink tomorrow night. And if you have <laughs> and what, what that would be. Uh, and uh, perhaps, uh, you know, <laughs> well, yeah. th there's, so it turns out there's been an interesting trend in, um, in the world of wine that is probably related to climate change, but this is not so far a bad one. Um, and that's that warmer summers have, and also the new world going to new places has allowed us to make higher test wines. So most Bordeaux wines of the 19th century were 8% alcohol. Today, if you get a, like one of the cult Cabernets from uh, Napa, it'll be 15%. So we've doubled the amount of uh, alcohol in the wine. Uh, now there's some people say that, that some, you lose some finesse and some other things from that. But I think on the stress relieving part, that might be okay. I think you've hit you've hit it for tomorrow night for sure. Um, well, Nathan, thank you so so much. This has really been uh, a pleasure uh, and a lot of fun um, and de stressing in and of itself. Um, and uh, uh, we just want to thank you. Um, okay. Well, so thank much. you. And uh, to everybody who uh, joined us, thank you very much. And we look forward to seeing you next Monday when I'm sure um, there'll be another great lecture. I don't actually know what it is at this point. Um, and uh, we've got chapter connectivity on Thursday um, with the Alaska chapter. 
Um, and uh, yeah, and everybody drink heavily tomorrow. Um, and thank you so, so much. Okay. Good night. <laughs>